Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. You can open your Bible, if possible, to the Gospel of Luke today. We are in Luke chapter 20, and we begin our study in verse number 1. Luke 20, verse 1, in just one minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out if you have not done that already. If you hunger for God's Word, <clears throat> that's a good place to go because that's all you'll find there is the Word of God taught verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Study the Word of God using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. And uh, we'll study God's Word together. You can do it at your fa pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages. That's at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Okay, Luke chapter 20. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 20, verse 1. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes came upon him with the elders. So Jesus taught the word of God, even though he knew that most people would not receive it. He taught the Bible, even though he knew beyond that it would anger the religious leaders. He spoke it, he taught it, he lived it, because it was the correct thing to do. He did all those things, because if you can only please one person in this world, it should be God. And he was pleasing God by speaking the plain truth. Verse 2, and he spake unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? They want to know who, go, who gave Jesus the right to teach the Bible. They also want to know who gave him the authority to enter the temple with a whip and drive out all the money changers and those who were doing business in that holy place. They want to know where he got the authority to do that. They want to know who sanctioned him, in essence. They ask because to them, Jesus was just a former carpenter from up north. He didn't have much formal education, if any. He didn't have any degrees. He was not accredited by their religious group or any other one. In other words, he wasn't a part of their religious machine. He was not a part of the establishment of the day. They did not pay him or appoint him, so they could not control him. And they didn't like that one bit. The reason that I have always maintained my independence is because I didn't want anyone to be able to control me except God. I was asked to come under the umbrella of a church and a denomination several years ago, and I refused because I don't want to be controlled by a denomination or paid by a denomination. This has been a faith ministry. I teach the Word of God, and I don't want anybody to say I can't do it. Not that I would listen to them, I wouldn't. But I just avoid the hassle. Verse 3. And he answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. 
Jesus doesn't have to answer their question because Jesus is God. God doesn't know anyone, any explanation for anything. But he does say, I will answer your question if you answer mine. You know what he's doing? He is testing their sincerity. So notice verse 4. Here's his question. The baptism of John. Was it from heaven or of man? Christ wants the leaders to tell him and everyone standing there what they really thought of John the Baptist. Was John a fraud or was he from God? That is our Lord's question to the religious leaders. Straightforward. Yes or no? Was John the Baptist from God or was he a fraud? Which one is it? Verse 5. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then believed ye him not? Their first mistake was to reason with themselves. Why would you do that if you're supposed to be a religious leader? They reason, why not just give a straight, it's a straight question, give a straight answer. Was he from God or not? What sort of reason? John the Baptist told all the people, including the religious leaders, to repent and to follow Christ. The leaders neither repented nor did they follow Christ. Consequently, if they say that John was from God, they are admitting that they are not godly because they aren't following John's instructions if he was from God. And they won't admit that because they're too proud to admit that they're wrong. They're too proud to confess any sin. So they won't say that John is from God because that would incriminate them. Verse 6. But they're still thinking. They're still reasoning among them. They, they had a huddle. They had a meeting to know how to answer this question in the most politically expedient way. Don't you just despise people like that? Especially if they're supposed to be religious leaders. Whatever happened to speaking the truth and letting the chips fall where they may and not worrying about it? Verse 6, but, and if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. So if they answer saying John the Baptist was from God, they incriminate themselves for not obeying him. On the other hand, if they say John was not from God, the people are going to kill them because the people believed that John was from God. Life sure is complicated when self is on the throne rather than God. Life sure is complicated when you have an agenda and you're seeking to honor yourself rather than simply letting go of all priorities except for one, pleasing God. That makes it so simple. That's one of the things I love about it. Not just because it's right. That's first and foremost. It honors God. That, of course, is most important. But it's also such a simple way to live. I don't reason within myself. I don't sit back. I never have. Sat back and thought, now, how are people going to respond if I say this? What difference does it make? I don't even go there. Never have. I read the word, I try to explain it as clearly as I can, and that's that. I've done my job. Leave it at that. Fine. Like it or don't like it, that's totally up to you. So they don't know what to say. Because if they say that John was not from God, then the people are going to kill him, kill them because they believe he was. Life sure is complicated, isn't it? 
So much easier to simply live to please God, speak the truth, and let what happens happen. Even if you suffer loss, even if you lose popularity, even if you lose money, even if you lose your life, what difference does it make? You're still on earth to please God, number one. It's not that difficult to figure out. Just do it. Of course, people who love themselves won't do it. They refuse to do it. Verse 8. No, verse 7. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. They could not tell. That was their answer. Was John from God or not? Well, we can't tell. After all their deliberation, that's the answer they came up with? We don't know? They are the religious leaders. And they don't know if John's ministry was from God or not, from heaven or hell. They don't know, and they're religious leaders. Man, you've got to be a pathetic religious leader if you cannot discern between right and wrong. They would rather have the people think that they were stupid, ignorant, than bad. But either way, no matter how you cut it, they're unfit to lead spiritually. Verse 8. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. If they're not smart enough to discern whether John the Baptist was from God or not, then how can they possibly be smart enough to suggest that Jesus isn't from God? If they don't have the discernment to determine if John the Baptist's message was from God or the devil, then how, all of a sudden, do they get sufficient discernment to determine that Jesus is not of God? Figure that one out. And the answer is, they don't have the discernment. The answer is they are spiritually blind because of the hardness of their own hearts and their love for their own sin and for their own false teaching rather than a love for God, which is why they're unfit to lead. You can't answer that question? Then what are you doing in the pulpit? Even worse, you refuse to answer that question? What are you doing in the pulpit? Modern evangelicalism is filled with preachers who refuse to speak the truth. Maybe they don't know it anymore. Maybe they've, maybe they've shunned the truth and, be, has, and have been cowardly concerning the truth for so long that they've lost all convictions concerning the truth. That could be in some cases. But it doesn't begin that way. And either way, what in the world are you doing in the pulpit except to make a, a name for yourself? And make yourself a little church kingdom where you make a pretty good living. Everybody thinks you're so loving and you're from hell. Verse 9. Actually, let's read verse 8 again. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. He's not going to say anything. The fact that they are not interested in truth means that Jesus isn't going to tell them. He's not going to tell. He's not going to tell them where he got the authority. Because if he told them, they wouldn't believe anyway because they're not interested in truth. So why open up his mouth and indulge them? Why lower yourself to answer people who aren't interested in truth? I don't do that. I honestly don't. I will sit with somebody and I will answer their honest, sincere Bible questions, try to, for as long as I have to. 
And if somebody's going through problems, I'll sit with them and I'll, and I'll give them guidance from the Word of God to the best of my ability. And if they have sincere questions and sincere doubts, I will try to help them. But when somebody, and you know the difference, when somebody knows the truth, they just hate it, I don't give them a time of day. Because Jesus didn't. And the fact that they are not interested in truth is why Jesus is not going to answer their question. If someone isn't interested in truth, it is a waste of time to talk to them. Why would you do that? You're wasting breath. Verse 9. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. Now, it was common for a landowner to hire farmers to take care of his fields and grow his crops. The farmers worked hard, they worked the land, and they paid the owner a certain portion of the crops as rent. That was standard procedure. So that's what's going on in this story that Jesus is telling. Verse 10. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. Instead of paying their rent, the produce that the owner deserved, they beat the servant who was sent to collect. The owner was not asking for anything unreasonable. He was only asking for what he deserved. Rent was due, now pay up. Verse 11, and again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. Well, this owner sure didn't give up easy, did he? And he was patient, he tried again. He gave the farmers another opportunity to do the right thing, but they did not. Verse 12. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. The owner tried a third time, but again, no rent was paid. The farmers, once again, beat his servant. The servants represent God's prophets who over the years God sent to Israel to look for spiritual fruit, to look for holiness, which is old God, and to call the people to repentance, which is also owed God. But time after time, the Israelites persecuted God's prophets instead of repenting according to God's word. That is what this story pictures. The faithful prophets, the faithful servants of God throughout the ages, and the people of God, supposedly, who rejected them. And if you think it's any different today, you get your head in the sand, or you're a part of the problem. Because most people in modern evangelicalism want their ears tickled. They do. They don't want to hear about repentance. They don't want to hear the word sin. They want to hear dysfunction. They want to hear behavior disorder. They want to hear they're sick, not sinful. They don't want to hear repentance. They don't want to hear hell. They don't want to hear devil. They don't want to hear demons. They don't want to hear anything uncool. Just make us feel good. Give us nice little principles to live by. And so that's what they receive. And you get somebody coming along who proclaims the pure word of God. It's like holding a cross before a vampire. They shrink right back. They curl, they, they squeal. 
It's exactly the way it was for all of Israelite history. They never tolerated the true prophets of God who spoke the word of God. They weren't interested. Didn't want anything to do with it. Verse 13. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. Of course, God knew that Israel would reject his son too. And they did. And he's talking to the religious rulers who are plotting his death right now. Is this relevant or not? I bet you their jaws dropped as Jesus told this story. Because this story is exactly what's going on. And they haven't told anyone. You don't have to tell God. Because God already knows. And Jesus is God. He knows what's going on. 14. But when the husbandmen saw, saw him, when they saw the son, when the farmers saw the son, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. In those days, there was a law that stated if a landowner died without any heirs, his inheritance would go to any tenant farmers who happened to be working the land. So the farmers are going to kill the son, eliminate the heir, and inherit the land for themselves. Boy, that's such a perfect picture of the religious leaders of our day and the religious leaders of our Lord's day. The religious leaders liked being in charge of the religious system in Israel. They really paid no attention to what the Word of God said. They picked and choose whatever they wanted to say. But they did not give the whole counsel of God. And they only said the things that made them look good and made them popular. They didn't want God in charge of their religion. They did not want God to be in charge of his people. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to be the focus of attention. They didn't want God the Son to rule. They wanted to rule. The haughty, self-righteous religious leaders were trying to usurp the authority and position of the Son of God. In essence, they said, Let's kill the heir so that the inheritance will be ours. Let's kill the son so that we can continue to run the religion of God our way. That's exactly what was going on. And that's exactly what happens way too often, even today. When the word of God is not proclaimed purely because of a fear of a lack of popularity or withholding offerings or whatever, that is no different than what the religious rulers of our, lays, our, our Lord's Day did. Let's not submit to the Lordship of God. Let's do things our way. We're building this empire. Who cares what God has said? That's uncool in the eyes of most people. So we don't want to go there. So look at. They said, we're going to kill the son and take over the land. We're going to kill the son and take over the religion of God. 15 and 16. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. The religious leader said, God forbid. <coughs> After hearing this story, that was their response. God forbid. Jesus said, the owner's going to come, kill those husbandmen. And their response is, God forbid. How can you say God forbid and pretend to be a righteous person? They're saying, certainly not. It can't be. How can they say that? 
Where is the outcry for justice over the murder of the owner's son? God forbid that they will be punished? Saying God forbid is like saying those evil tenant farmers should not be punished for the sin of murder. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. That's what it's saying. These evil farmers should not be punished for the sin of murder. You know, part of the responsibility of being a good person is doing what you can to stop bad people. And obviously, these religious leaders were not good people. They weren't interested in stopping bad. They were only interested in preserving their standing in the religious community. And if that meant selling out God and selling out the Word of God and the Son of God and the prophets of God, well, then they would do it. Simple. They would do it. They weren't concerned about anything else. Verse 17. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? You can reject God's Son, but Almighty God is making him the cornerstone of the church. God's going forward with his Son whether you're on board or not. Sorry about that. Doesn't matter what they want. God's plan goes forward. It doesn't matter what puny people want or haughty religious leaders want. Or atheists want. Doesn't matter what they want. Doesn't matter what bad people want. God's plan is going forward with Jesus and his faithful remnant who proclaim the word of God and those who follow the word of God. That's what's going to happen. And Jesus says this in verse 18. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You know what Jesus is saying? If you fall upon that stone, if you hear the message of Christ, repentance, turning away from sin, asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, if you fall upon that stone, you're going to be broken. All your haughtiness, your pride, your self-righteousness is going to be broken. It has to be broken in order to repent and receive Christ and trust Him and submit to His Lordship. But you'll end up in good shape if you do that. But on whomsoever that stone falls, if you reject Jesus Christ and you refuse to repent and you continue on and you in your lukewarm ways or in your just flat-out rejection of God's Word, you continue on that. That stone's going to fall on you and it's going to grind you to powder. You're going to be the loser. Because God does not lose. Jesus does not lose. And his faithful followers, they may, get big, they may not have it as, as good right now in this life, but believe me, when it's all over and the dust clears, they're going to be on top with Jesus Christ. And I'm out of time. Continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click and listen to whatever Bible book you want to study, whatever chapter, whatever section, just click and listen. Follow along in your Bible. Let's study the Word of God together from Genesis through Revelation. Let's do it at your pace, at your convenience, right there at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. Never have been. This has been a faith ministry. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, you want to stand with me and help me to do this and help me to get the Word of God out to more and more people, 
then pray for me, pray for the word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. So long.